Well, good afternoon. Uh, good morning if we're finding you out west. And thanks for uh, joining us for our webinar today, uh, Making the Most of Your Legacy Society. My name is Nathan Stelter, president here at the Stelter Company, and happy to be here uh, to uh, introduce our presenter, Margaret Holman. Uh, but before I do, uh, I'd like to just say a couple quick words uh, around the webinar series, as many of you are probably familiar with, as, as an expert advocate and asset-based giving, Stelter's committed and has been for a long time to providing innovative solutions and education for this industry. Uh, we pride ourselves on really being this bridge builder for the nonprofit community, and as such, uh, are happy to host uh, this complimentary webinar today, as well as a whole slate of webinars uh, throughout this year. Uh, connecting you to experts from across the country uh, to hopefully assist you really in maximizing revenue uh, across your donor portfolios. Today's webinar is our second of our 2023 curriculum. Uh, we have an absolute terrific lineup, including Margaret this year, as well as Russell James, Philip Purcell, Jeng Chang, uh, and Wayne Olson, just to name a few. Uh, we host about one per month, uh, so keep an eye on your email uh, for your personal invitations. But as always, you can go to stelter.com backslash webinars uh, to register for any of those, as well as access uh, our archive of webinars from not only this year, but previous years. So uh, for today, uh, very excited to uh, have a longtime friend of mine, Margaret Holman here. I think it's been 20 years, 20 plus years or so. Uh, when we were two, when we were right? two. I still remember our first breakfast in Midtown and uh, being able to kind of sit down and learn more about uh, the great things that Margaret has done. And very honored to have her today to share some insights. If you don't know Margaret, I haven't had the chance to, to hear from her. You're in for a treat. She's the, the president of Holman Consulting, which is really a full service uh, fundraising consulting firm uh, that she founded back in New York City back in 1991. Uh, Margaret has served as senior vice president for development and communications at really at America's first and largest humane society, the ASPCA. Uh, also held senior fundraising management positions at a variety of arts, health, and educational institutions throughout the country. Uh, she's an emeritus president of the Philanthropic Planning Group of Greater New York, was president of Women in Development in New York, and serves on the Greater New York chapter of the AFP board. Uh, Margaret's co-author of The Complete Guide to Careers in Fundraising and Major Gifts Fundraising, and is contributing author of the Nonprofit Consulting Playbook and Faithful Giving, The Heart of Playing Gifts. Excited again about the topic, a very uh, important topic for a lot of uh, individuals on the call today, uh, Margaret, and I will hand it off to you. Well, thank you, Nate, uh, and welcome everybody. Uh, Nate, the uh, introduction check is in the mail. Don't spend it all at one time, okay? <laughs> uh, it's great to be with you all today, and the sun is shining here in New York City. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, and Jen, if you want to make it pot, there we go. So I have to start every webinar with a reference to chocolate. Uh, and what is a legacy society? It's the icing on the cake and not the cake. So uh, I think as we go through this seminar, you'll figure that out. So um, what is a legacy society? Well, it needs to be an integral part of your entire program. It is a method of communication and stewardship for your most loyal donors. And we all know that planned giving is getting the right message to the right person at the right time and following up on that message. I'll never forget uh, visiting a donor uh, in Pittsburgh, PA, and uh, we went to her house and she had a stack of third class mail sitting on her little entryway. And I asked her how many organizations did she give to? And she thought for a minute and she said about 40. And I knew how much she was giving to this organization on a monthly basis times 40 times 12. She was a major, major donor. When a couple of years passed, we kept in contact with her. Uh, and I got that call that uh, is upsetting and gratifying at the same time from the attorney saying that she had passed away and uh, that we were in the will. And I'm thinking, okay, divided by 40 uh, is what our little piece is going to be. And he said, no, you're the only 
uh, charity in her will. And I was rather shocked. And he said, nobody ever out of the other 39 organizations ever kept in touch with her. You guys were the only ones who did that. So it's, it is a way for, the, for your charity to continue to be a member of the family. So, oh, sorry, back. So um, this is from a, a 2016 planned giving study. And you can see the top 10 reasons why people really think that legacy societies are important. They offer an, an opportunity to acknowledge, thank, and engage donors. Uh, they are open to all individuals, regardless of their wealth ranking. Uh, they recognize donors during their lifetime. And uh, they, offer, they offer the opportunity to become more engaged in the organization. One of our donors came uh, to see us and said, my mother and I have left you in our wills. Uh, and we, we started building further that relationship. The daughter eventually became a board member. Uh, so, and their giving, their, their uh, annual giving never decreased uh, just because we were in the will. So those are the main four reasons why you want to have a legacy society. So um, for donors to remain connected to your organization, even after their annual giving uh, stops, and Stelter has a great uh, article about this on discovering uh, the secret donors. And if you look at this chart, you can see that uh, the percentage of people with a bequest is really strong at the age of 65 plus. And the percentage of people with wills opening uh, to making a future bequest is very strong. And, uh, but it drops down a little bit when uh, they are 65 plus. So you really need to get them uh, as soon as you can and get connected to the organization. So when do you wanna start a legacy society? Well, if you don't have one and you have a planned gift program, now is the time. The time has run out. You really need to begin a legacy society. If you're planning uh, a gift program, you want to incorporate that right in your initial planning and uh, take some time to think about how you are going to organize that. So uh, making a list of your current planned gift donors and be sure that they really have made a planned gift. Uh, sending out a, a letter announcing the society. Uh, when possible, visit your donors. And now that the worst seemingly of the COVID is over, uh, people are much more engaged in coming out uh, to events and uh, to meeting you for uh, a breakfast or a lunch or whatever. And developing an, an ad for your regular newsletter for the opportunity to join as a charter member. And most of my clients open that charter membership if you're starting a new plan for several years. Uh, one year, two year, three years uh, to become a charter member of the organization, of the society. So legacy society names, they are all over the map. 
Uh, a lot of folks use the founding year uh, of their organization, uh, but um, the, the thing of it is, is that you really want to make sure that the legacy society name is reflective of your organization. So uh, folks who have legacy societies, the generic legacy society, you may want to think about uh, making it more personalized uh, for your institution. So uh, for instance, one of my clients, the Museum of the City of New York has a, a uh, Alexander Hamilton's desk, uh, his actual desk. Uh, and so when we were thinking about uh, the name of the, the Legacy Society, uh, we of course thought about the desk uh, and the history of um, Alexander Hamilton here in, in New York. And of course, the play Hamilton was going on at the time. So uh, we it is now named the Alexander Hamilton Visionaries Society. And I'll, and I'll do that, uh, I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. So what you don't want is the Tombstone Society or the Pine Box Society. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you're laughing about this. Uh, many, many years ago when I was doing a seminar on uh, legacy societies and recognition, I asked the crowd uh, what the names were of their organizations. And uh, somebody actually called it the Pine Box Society because there were stands of pine trees that lined the road to their organization. So after everybody gasped in the um, class, uh, a couple of weeks went by and I this was pre-emails and all of that sort of stuff. And I got a letter at the office uh, from that person and, and the gist of the letter was, this is the last piece of the Pine Box Society stationery that I have. I want you to know that I've renamed the organization, the, the, the society, uh, something else. So don't be clever, just be uh, intentional about what you want to call the society. So a welcome packet, uh, people in this particular stage of their lives love to get mail. And that was even more prevalent over the last couple of two, three years. So when that was a, a primary way of communicating, so the, the letter welcoming them should come from your executive director or your chairperson of the board. You want to list your benefits. You may want to invite them to an upcoming event. Uh, and uh, the special item from your gift shop or a book somewhat close to the organization or, uh, uh, you know, people of this age group in the higher age, uh, the, the 80 plusers, uh, they like masks and are still wearing masks uh, in some parts of the country. I'm not seeing very many pins anymore. Uh, and it'll be interesting to find out uh, what your thoughts are on pins, but they were the big thing. Uh, probably 10 or 15 years ago. So you may want to think about a pin. So how do we market our legacy society? Well, there are lots of communication channels now and you can see that list. Uh, it's interesting that the leading edge of the baby boomers are now in the planned firmly in the planned gift zone. 
And our expert now at email, uh, at Zooms, all of those si sorts of things. Whereas back when I started in planned giving, it was letters and postcards and telephone calls. Uh, so these are some of the ideas of ways in which that you can communicate with your folks. Will seminars uh, were reverted to uh, webinars, uh, but now are starting to come back in person. So, um, and also a very ex inexpensive way to uh, market your legacy society or and or your planned gift program is to have a checkbox box on your uh, direct mail reply cards. I've already remembered the XYZ organization in my will, or I'd be interested in doing that. So uh, those are some of the ways in which my clients are using uh, marketing for societies. So this is a, a clip from a website uh, and introducing the Legacy Society's founding directors, uh, which I thought was a very interesting way to do this. Notice that not everybody in the group is 112 years old. Uh, they are uh, a variety of ages uh, and they are examples to your donors of the possibility of uh, joining the Legacy Society. So websites, um, you want to keep this simple because people are using it across a lot of different platforms from their iPads to their phones to their actual computer. Uh, so you want to make it visual, uh, keep in mind the type size, uh, and you don't want to have a whole lot of verbiage. Uh, you want to have people uh, have the opportunity to click through. Uh, and so you just want it to keep simple, keep it simple. So here are some uh, Legacy Society ads. Uh, notice that they all have pictures. Uh, they are all um, have great cut lines. Our, our Legacy supports and explains what the uh, organization does. Uh, the center one has a historic flavor and uh, the the one from Maine has a wonderful opportunity to take advantage of uh, a variety of things. So uh, I think websites are, are very important to the, the entire process. So um, listing organizations, and you can see that the Metropolitan Opera has an encore society uh, and they list by state uh, folks who have been able to remember them with a gift in their will. This goes on for several, several pages. Uh, the opera has had a program for uh, probably more than 30 years so that their uh, program is uh, one of the places that they have an opportunity to list folks. Uh, and what you want to do is to be sure that A, you have the correct spelling of the person's name, it goes without saying, and that you, you need to figure out how they want to be listed. Is it Mr. and Mrs. Roger Smith or Roger and Ann Smith? Uh, or uh, anonymous. So um, that, that's a really important part of uh, the recognition process. Legacy society events. Well, we're, they're coming back. 
Uh, they're coming back strong. Uh, usually they are for breakfast or for lunch. Uh, and those organizations who have them in the evening discover fairly quickly that people don't like to, in this particular age group, go out for an evening event. So uh, having it uh, at a place where they wouldn't normally uh, have access to, like your office or um, somebody's home or somewhere else is a wonderful thing. Uh, you want to keep this small. Uh, I didn't count how many people were in this particular photograph, but you know, it is a wonderful thing when you have 50, 60 people come, uh, but the prime thing is to have 10 to 20 people. Why is that? It's because you get the opportunity to speak to everybody individually and your follow-up is a lot easier when you only have to talk to or contact or keep in contact with 10, 15, 20 people. So um, speakers always is a challenge uh, or it might not be. Uh, so speakers are uh, important for this. Uh, seating is definitely important. You know, you may or may not decide to have a little goodie bag uh, at the end with some materials in it or a little uh, gift. Uh, and the, the folks who had uh, not interrupted their um, legacy society events and but switch them over to virtual events had a hard time to begin with and then as everybody got uh, comfortable with doing this then uh, the virtual events seem to be more popular in some ways than in person so uh, it just depends on where you're located uh, how big your list is uh, and um, what it is that you're going to talk about. Um, having uh, someone from outside the organization, like an attorney or a financial planner is always helpful. Uh, and uh, keeping the program to 20, 30 minutes uh, with an opportunity for them to tour your facility or to meet your uh, CEO or somebody from your program staff is always a winner. So events. This is a, an event that the Metropolitan Opera did uh, and it was an email and they have an Encore Society event uh, that's coming up uh, for an entire day. Uh, and uh, as you get access to this presentation, you can read uh, all of the activities during the day uh, and um, they are excessively popular. Uh, and uh, folks really love to do this. Uh, the New York City Ballet also has a, a Legacy Society lunch uh, and they invite uh, several of the ballerinas and uh, other ballet stars to come and to talk uh, and to sit and have lunch with uh, their donors. So it is a festive sort of thing. So uh, this is another example of uh, an of a uh, event for. Uh, the Burnett Society, uh, and they have a lunch uh, and a tour. And you can see how they uh, organize their responses with 
your preferences for food. Uh, I've not seen <laughs> a whole lot of other organizations do this kind of thing, but I thought that that was very interesting. So who are our best prospects for our legacy societies? Uh, those who between 60 and, and 75, uh, or those who between 75 and 85, and those who are over 85. Uh, and apparently Americans are living another 18 years beyond uh, even 10 years ago. So uh, I, I think that all three groups are obviously the best pro, uh, prospects. And FLAG stands for frequent, long time, older, gender, meaning lady donors. Um, we find that many of the bequest donors and members of legacy societies are women. So you don't want to forget them uh, and you want to organize them by the frequent, long time, older age data is very important and uh, gender uh, donors. So that, that is your marketplace. So uh, who is eligible for legacy society membership? So um, if they've informed you of a gift by any of these means, uh, bequests, life insurance, gift annuities, remainder trusts, lead trusts, retirement plan designation, endowment fund, uh, they're all should be in your uh, legacy society. Uh, so that, um, they all are planning to leave you a portion of their asset base in the future. So um, oftentimes I'm asked by, uh, does, it a does age matter? No, it does not. Uh, realized versus bequest intense doesn't matter, but verification may matter. The New York Public Library was among the very first uh, nonprofits here in New York City who required a legal document, uh, a letter of intent to be in the file in order to be recognized as a member of the Legacy Society. Uh, that happens from time to time, but most of the organizations that uh, I work with do not require that uh, based on uh, extending that relationship and um, keeping them uh, thinking that your charity is a member of their family. So that's what donors are doing when they are making these kinds of gifts. So, the benefits of legacy society membership, birthday cards are very important, quarterly mailings from key staff and volunteer leadership, uh, the aforementioned events. Uh, some organizations have uh, recognition on walls or on the website or in an ad. Uh, the days of certificates and pins are waning, I think, uh, but this is from the Archdiocese of New York, and they have an annual mass and, and member luncheon, uh, and um, they, it, it is extremely well attended, and notice that line that says seating is limited, so that's how they uh, it attract uh, quite a few people. And here's the Legacy of Faith Society of the Archdiocese of New York from 2020, several years ago. Uh, but you can see that they list members uh, to the left and uh, those who have passed on to the right. So uh, that folks 
realize that even after they're gone, they will still be listed and remembered uh, with affection uh, and gratitude by the organization. So uh, stewardship, uh, this is from Market Smart. Uh, suggestions of how to do this, survey them, uh, prioritize them, know what motivates them, personalize everything, create an alumni feeling. Uh, it, testimonials are probably one of the most effective marketing uh, programs uh, and having somebody else other than your uh, executive director or you yourself sign the letter, uh, tell about their own personal journey to making this kind of gift, making them feel like heroes, uh, uh, telling them what their gift has impacted, uh, call and visit uh, when you can. Uh, they love that kind of thing. So um, stewardship is oftentimes the neglected uh, thing about legacy societies. And the reason that uh, our uh, donor who was recognizing 40 organizations in her monthly giving uh, left out 39 organizations and left it just to our organization was because we kept in touch and uh, we sent her a birthday card and uh, we called whenever we were in town and we just checked up on her. So keeping that in mind as you're, you're planning as to what you're going to be doing. Uh, this is a uh, interesting thing from stewardship. It says, thank you for being a Burnett Society member and for your support. Uh, and you should have received an invitation to our annual lunch. And um, Jen, go ahead and do your magic. Hey everyone, Kim Waller with the University of Nebraska Foundation. I am here on the UNO campus at the Biomechanics Research Building where we will have our annual Burnett Society lunch on Friday, April 14th at noon. Um, after our lunch, we will have a tour of this great facility. We'll see things like the prosthetics lab and we'll also come here to the pitching lab where you'll be able to see some athletes, student athletes taking part in the research being done um, just with movement of the body and that. So. Uh, it should be a great event. We are so looking forward to being together in person again this year and then having the tour. Um, if you are unable to join us, which I know so many of you live outside of Nebraska and can't make it, we will be putting together a video of the lunch and the tour. We'll be sending that out to everyone afterwards so that you can actually see the great facility that we have here uh, to share with you. But uh, invitations have gone out. You should have received your invitation. If you have any questions about that event, that's coming up or anything else in regard to Burnett or your planned gift, please feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is at the very, very end of this video. But thank you so much for being a Burnett Society member. We are grateful for your support. Thank you for your planned gift and all that you do for the university. So until then, please take good care. Let me know if you have any questions and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So this is the... Um yeah, this is a very effective use of uh, the, the electronic stuff that we have today. So um, in conclusion, let's create and name your legacy society to reflect your organization's culture. Uh, figure out how you're going to acknowledge and more importantly, steward these donors. Uh, establish a charter membership for the first two years. Uh, give that serious consideration. Uh, 
take the opportunity to include information on your legacy society and all of your marketing materials. And it goes without saying to find a board member or a prominent volunteer to champion the society. Uh, and uh, you may want to um, have a space on your board meeting once a year to recognize those folks. So I think we're doing Q&A right now. Yes, we have a lot of questions. Ah, so get so ready. So many questions, Margaret. So many, so many questions. <laughs> uh, one so of the answers. <laughs> one of the topics that struck a chord that a lot of people are commenting on is uh, realized um, bequests and how long you should. Well, should someone saying, should you have them on your list still? If so, how long should you leave them on your list? And do you need to get permission from family members or someone to be able to put them on your list? Uh, geez, five questions in one. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> uh, yes, you need to leave uh, realized bequests on your list in perpetuity. And that is one of the reasons why people make these kinds of gifts is because they want to leave a legacy and they want to be remembered for as long as, uh, as the organization is around. I don't know anybody who has taken uh, the deceased folks, the realized bequests off uh, on a, any kind of time schedule. It is, it is a permanent record of the folks who believed in your organization. And it's an opportunity to answer the last part of that question. Uh, it's an opportunity to go back to the family to say how much we loved Aunt Gertrude's uh, bequest. And we would like to list her permanently as a member of our legacy society. And 99.9% .9 of the time they say, that's that's what Aunt Gertrude would have liked. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Margaret. And I think there's even been some, uh, some threads on the CGP link, link listserv over the years around that exact topic on, uh, you know, do we put them on? How do we get the approval? Uh, and the idea of the legacy society is really to hopefully let this live on in perpetuity. Uh, so yep. I love that. We have a couple people asking about endowment donors. Um, you had mentioned including endowment donors in the society. I'm wondering if that includes donors um, who give to the endowment, but they don't end up making a planned gift. Yes, uh, I, I think that uh, listing endowment donors is a wonderful example to other people who are perusing the list. And if you want to segment at that them out and say, uh, you know, endowment donors and list all of their names, uh, that is a wonderful way to advertise the fact that you're looking for endowment funds and you're looking for people who will consider endowing their annual gift. couple people asking, and Nathan, you can jump in anytime if you want. A couple people asking um, about the events that they host. A lot of them uh, host events in the morning, like a coffee mm -hmm. chat. Mm -hmm. But some people are now having uh, events at night and um, have found them a little bit more successful. Um, they're wondering if you have thoughts on that. Um, one gentleman said, is it just better because having hard conversations about death is better when you're drinking wine than when you're drinking coffee. <laughs> well, that works for me. <laughs> uh, but um, my experience has been that uh, it really depends upon the age of your legacy society members. If they're skewed to the younger side, saying 65 to 75 or so, yes, you should try a, uh, an evening event. 
if they are over the age of 75, uh, they probably will prefer uh, getting out during the daylight hours. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but driving at night is can be a scary experience, especially when you're 75 and, and up. So um, food is important. Uh, uh, many of my clients uh, order double the amount of donuts and or cookies uh, because people tend to take those home uh, with them uh, at the conclusion of the, the seminar. So uh, I think this is an individual uh, organization kind of question uh, that you will have to suss out for yourself, but most often they are at breakfast or lunch. Yeah, I would agree. I think there are some nuances there with uh, the type of organization you are, maybe the proximity to your donors and you know, time of year, even, you know, it's lighter later, you know, this time of year than it is uh, later in the day than it is in uh, other uh, times of the year. So um, actually, Jen, I will jump in. Thank you for the invitation. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's a couple questions here, and I, and I hear this all the time, too, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, Margaret, around how do you make sure donors, the donors have really made a planned gift? And again, I think somebody referenced the comment you made about the New York Public Library desire to have a formal letter, and I've seen this in variations at other shops, too. You know, are there pros and cons or are there things that you found successful or, you know, how, how do you confirm that? You know, that's always a question. Uh, it uh, is always a question. And it's a tricky question uh, because uh, some donors don't want anybody to know that they've actually done this. Uh, that percentage is kind of small. Uh, but there is, it's a challenge to make a letter or to have somebody sign a document that uh, says it, that freezes their uh, their choice to make this kind of gift, especially for a bequest. I'll remember, and Nate, you probably remember as well, when Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis died, she had a litany of uh, bequests and uh, intentions to set up a charity and all that kind of thing. And there was no money. There was just, there was no money. So uh, despite our best efforts to make this legally binding, these kinds of, the, this bequest gift, life income gifts are completely a different ball of wax. But for the bequests, it's very difficult to uh, cement that into place. So you can ask people to sign a letter of intent and that's what it really is, is a, I intend to do this uh, and keep that in your file or scan that or whatever, however your record keeping is going. But, um, you know, this is, this is on faith. And this is, but 80% of all planned gifts come in the form of bequests. So we must be doing something right. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. The, the bequest intention form, again, not a legal binding form, but uh, one of my mentors years ago, Jeff Comfort, I think shared with me what he had done at mm -hmm. Georgetown that I really loved because, you know, it's that moment when somebody raises their hand and says, yes, I've left you and you. Um, you know, we obviously, as hopefully good fundraisers, we thank them and, you know, we're, we're, we're asking them, you know, the appropriate questions. But I remember him sharing his bequest intention form. It was really simple. And I see a question on here talking about how do you get donor? What are your thoughts on donors on asking the donor the value of their estate? You know, I think with all the fluctuations we've seen between the pandemic, between 08, 09, you know, having percentage designation is a lot more palatable for people than maybe putting a dollar amount. But what I loved about the simplicity and beauty of Jeff's form is it was really pretty simple. And it was open-ended asking them for, why did you decide to do this? It was a mm -hmm. great, it was fresh in the donor's mind. You know, they just raised their hand. It's a lot easier than going back six months or 12 months later to try to get a donor story and trying to open up that invitation for them to share their story at that time. So it was kind of serving two purposes in that bequest intention form. And, and the, uh, the New York Public Library, well, once they changed the culture and it took them a long time to change the culture, 
uh, that it became acceptable for people and they expected to have a letter of intent to sign. Right. So it, it took a long time. John Bacon will tell you it took a long time. Oh, yeah. But now it is, it, it's regular kind of thing. Yeah, and, and I think it's the powers that be sometimes that are, are, are maybe pushing more for the um, uh, the documentation, uh, because you're right, we're taking people at their word largely, so many gifts coming through a, a revocable bequest that gives people control over that gift, and the only time I've ever seen it, I, I've always been of the adage, it doesn't hurt to take them well, because guess what, it gives you an excuse to thank them and steward them and build a further relationship. And the only time I've ever seen where there was a little question was in the, an arts organization that one of their benefits, we went through benefits earlier on uh, society, was free annual passes. And ah. a woman who was on their society, every year they'd ask for documentation and because she'd ask for way more passes than she uh, you know, needed. Uh, she would say, well, I'm just going to take you out of my plans. Uh, <laughs> so that was the only time because there was like a monetary connection. Um, but outside of that, it's, it's no harm, no foul to take them at their word. Uh, it's exactly right. This is exactly right. So you'll see I moved the slides back. We did have a gentleman that asked to see the benefit slide again. And Nathan, you were just mentioning the benefits. So I thought I'd go ahead and put that up there so that uh, John can take a look at that. And quick question, going all the way back to the beginning of the uh, session, Margaret, Catherine is wondering about the pins. She's wondering, uh, do you suggest handing those out at an event or a personal visit, or is it okay to mail them? Um, for somebody who's living in Hawaii, I am available to personally deliver the pin. So uh, uh, yes, it is uh, the, the number one way to do this is to have an, like an induction ceremony at your uh, Legacy Society event and call people um, forward and present them a pin, uh, but um, and a personal visit if they can't get there. Uh, and uh, that's number two. Uh, number three, if they live in Timbuktu and you and you just can't get there, mailing is the third option. And I do I think this... right. if you have an event, you know, having people wear those gets people talking too. Mm -hmm. If you can present them in person, I remember being at a Girl Scouts event uh, years ago and I had their uh, their chair of their society and just an amazing woman. Uh, they had three people stand up and say, I want to put them in my society right now or in my, in my plans right now. And so it was just kind of this organic induction of sorts. But you're right. Yeah, I mean, if you, get, if you have a chance of getting people face to face, having those pens can get people starting to talk. And, and the pins are uh, interesting in themselves. Uh, Girls Inc. Uh, had a founding member of their Legacy Society, and she was well known within the, within the group, and she was a turtle person. So they decided to make little silver turtles pins, and everybody wore them all the time because they were so beautiful uh, as a piece of jewelry. And people would say, so where'd you get that turtle pin? Oh, I belong to the Girls Inc. Legacy Group. So it was an, uh, another way of advertising what was happening. So I moved the slides again back to your Legacy Society's Best Prospects flag. We have a couple people that want um, to have you repeat what flag stands for and just that concept a little bit more. Sure. Uh, F stands for frequent. L stands for a long time. A, a stands for age. And G stands for gender. So we're looking for, if you don't have age appended to your file, uh, if you look for your frequent longtime donors, regardless of whether or not they gave to you within the last two or three years, they are probably your planned gift prospects. But if you have, uh, age, meaning birth dates uh, on your file, then you can sort uh, using age as your first thing, 
the frequency and the longevity of their donations. It does not matter uh, how much they are giving. They don't have to be a major gift donor. Uh, in fact, my husband's auntie and uncle um, lived from uh, paycheck to paycheck. They only had cash. They had no credit cards. They owned their house, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We thought the estate would be very modest. And they left a quarter of a million dollars to each of their favorite charities. And I called the development director and I said, can and I explained what I was doing and all that sort of thing. And I said, can you look up their giving history and their cumulative giving history over a period of 15 years totaled up to 128 bucks. So we're looking for our frequent long time older lady donors. Gotcha. Thank you. How important is it for the executive director or chairperson to be a member of the Legacy Society? Uh, I think that is uh, that sends signals, especially to the board, uh, that they should also consider uh, being a member of the society. Uh, there are all sorts of options for younger uh, chairs. Uh, and CEOs uh, that they could do a life insurance gift. They could do a lot of, uh, of, of other gifts uh, that would qualify them to be a part of the society. So it is, it is a, a two gold stars, uh, but you shouldn't uh, stop your program if neither of them are a member. Edward says that they do not include endowment gifts in their society. Could you talk about why they should do that? Because uh, people are thinking uh, forward uh, and uh, they are wanting uh, a name recognition for their forward thinking uh, guarantee that a fund or a scholarship or a professorship or a program will uh, move forward even after they have gone or they are they stop supporting your charity. So it is a wonderful recognition of their commitment to the future. And we had Carla that was interested in looking at the eligible plans again. So I have put that slide back up for you. Sure. Um, and then we have a couple of questions about, you mentioned charter memberships and they're wondering what would be the advantage um, to be a charter member? Why would they want to do that? Uh, it is, uh, first of all, name recognition uh, and that uh, you would list in perpetuity, all of the folks who are your charter members under that category. Uh, and, and it appeals to certain kinds of donors uh, who want to be in that exclusive group. It works for some organizations. It does not work for others. Uh, it depends on your organization's culture. Laura's asking, if you keep realized donors on your list in perpetuity, how far back do you go to start the list? <laughs> uh, they received 30 to 50 estate. They receive 30 to 50 estate gifts a year. Wow. That's wonderful. Congratulations. Uh, and uh, as I said, for the uh, Metropolitan Opera, that the, in the program, it goes for at least six pages of people who are in their uh, Encore Society. And that just is a, uh, a, a record and a marketing technique uh, and a recognition of the um, really family tie that those donors had with the organization 
And um, I would go back to the beginning of time, if you, if you can, uh, with your records and uh, keep continuing to list them. I would 100% agree. And, you know, I know you've seen versions of those lists, Margaret, where, you know, maybe you have your, your living active members at the beginning and then you have the estate get uh, estates after or you've italicized them or put an asterisk. 100%. I mean, again, this the idea of this is perpetuity and the, the, the nature that we know a lot of plain gifts we won't find out about till after the fact. This is exactly our way to honor and thank them. Uh, we have a couple of questions about kind of rebranding a society that has kind of um, been allowed to kind of die off. It hasn't gotten much attention. There's been no sustained cultivation. The name isn't great. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any experience in this rebranding, renaming? Yes. Uh, it, as a matter of fact, the Museum of the City of New York just went through a rebranding uh, for their legacy society. And that was the Alexander Hamilton Visionaries. It used to be the Starlight Society and it was named after a rather massive chandelier right in the entryway. Uh, and it was allowed to languish. And uh, so they, because we are in uh, the, their centennial year, their 100th anniversary, we took that opportunity to rebrand uh, and make it more meaningful. Uh, and we brought out the desk, the Alexander Hamilton desk, uh, and we invited all of the members of the former Starlight Society, now that we were rebranding into the um, Alexander Hamilton visionaries, and they were able to sign a book uh, on the desk and we had individual pictures of them taken at the desk signing the book. So it is, you can make uh, a, a wonderful um, marketing opportunity by changing the name. Do you, a couple of people are wondering if you should have a required minimum donation to be invited into the Legacy Society? Absolutely not. I, th I think Nate is shaking his head in, affirm in a affirmation. 100%. <laughs> and then one last question, because we are almost out of time. Should DAFs be included? Oh, sure. Great. So we are out of time. We do have a handful of questions we didn't get to, um, but if you would like to reach out to Margaret, she has offered her email addresses on the screen, mholman at holmanconsulting.com. You can also reach out to Nathan or myself. And if you'd like to know more about Stelter, our products and services, you can visit us at stelter.com. Uh, webinar resources and some other resources. We had some people asking about um, some samples, some gift intention forms, um, samples from Jeff Comfort. I think you mentioned Nathan. Yeah. Um, so I'll try to um, get get my hands on those, and then we will have the recording and the handouts and those other things. They'll be available on our website at seltercom backslash webinars, and I will be sending out an email to everyone who registered to let you know when those are available. They should be there by Friday, but you can just wait for my email. And that's it. That's what we got today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Margaret, for sharing the last hour with us. We had so many people thanking you in the Q&A. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, good luck and everybody have a great rest of the week. Thanks. Bye-bye.